Thank you for the chance to share some of our research on governance as it applies to big ticket infrastructure projects. Uh, this presentation draws on a research paper, a case study that we prepared uh, about two years back focused on the Bataan nuclear power plant case as a uh, rather dramatic case of a white elephant project uh, in the Philippines. It is still quite distinct in the developing world as one of the biggest uh, white elephant projects ever uh, identified, uh, ever embroiled in a corruption case uh, as far as our research goes. So um, it's my pleasure to share uh, some of the findings of this research for your group. Uh, and we hope this is a case that can be used by different advocates uh, working against corruption and certainly read by many young people who want to better understand um, some of the governance failures that took place under the Marcos administration. Let me begin by first uh, describing the economic situation. Uh, this is a country uh, that is actually close to ours. Uh, if you can tell from the leaders, this is Malaysia. Uh, and uh, it basically gives us a picture of the economic situation in this country uh, from 1960 to 2016, based on the real GDP per capita uh, in, in, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, and it gives us a snapshot of the continued development of this country from 1960 to around 2016 uh, and beyond. And um, what they managed to achieve is a sevenfold increase in their economy in real terms from 1960 to around the present. This is another country, uh, Indonesia, um, that also grew from 1960 to 2016. And its growth rate uh, actually enabled it to achieve a six-fold increase uh, in the Indonesian economy in real terms uh, during the same period. Now, I, want, I wanted to show you these countries so that you have a better sense of what happened to us in the Philippines. This is us uh, during the same period. And what we went through essentially from 1960 to the present is only a two-fold increase in the Philippine economy. Uh, so if you will look at the graph, which is showing us the real GDP per capita in the country, uh, you will see here around 1983 uh, that essentially there was a very, very deep economic contraction, an economic crisis that eventually was followed by uh, two decades of uh, catch up, uh, essentially a period of trying to pay off high debts a period of trying to recover uh, institutions and uh, improve governance uh, in the economic and other spheres. And uh, what we managed to achieve by around 2003 is uh, that we basically reclaimed the lost uh, output uh, that we once had in real terms in 1983. So let me put that differently. Yung pong 2003 real GDP per capita ng bansa ay kapareho lang nung 1983 real GDP per capita ng bansa. So na-recover na lang natin yung nawala sa atin nung 1983. Uh, at syempre, ang, ang narrative nito ay uh, medyo simple. Ba basically, dahil sa lalim ng crisis na nangyari sa atin, uh, it took us about two decades, uh, 1983 to 2003, in order to recover what we merely had uh, before this uh, economic crisis uh, took place. Uh, and, the, and the reality is that much of that catch up uh, that needed to take place was because of the damage uh, to institutions, the high debt, and the very bad investment decisions that were made uh, under the Marcos regime. So pinagbayaran ng Pilipinas yung mga mistakes na yan at uh, it took us about two decades to actually recover, at least uh, in terms of real GDP per capita. Uh, here's another snapshot of what is the uh, social implication of such uh, an economic trajectory uh, under the Marcos regime. So this is basically uh, the average self-rated poverty incidence. This is uh, one of the longer run indicators of poverty that we have in the country. It's collected by Social Weather Station. And you will see that under the Marcos regime, the self-rated poverty incidence was upwards of 65%. Uh, and it only be, be, began to go down uh, after uh, the Marcos regime. 
and uh, with the recovery of the Philippine economy as well. So you'll see uh, that uh, poverty during the present time is just around uh, the 40% range. This does not yet include the possible impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic in 2020. But suffice to say that we have managed to reduce poverty, self-rated poverty at least over time. Um, and thanks to the types of reforms and institutions building that we managed to pull off uh, since uh, the fall of the dictator in uh, the mid 80s. Now, uh, what is uh, the issue as far as the governance situation under the dictatorship? Well, uh, it was characterized by many as having deep governance uh, challenges and, and particularly deep corruption affecting various parts of the economy. So one way to describe it, uh, which was reported widely by media, is that uh, the Marcos cronies, essentially these business people that were very, very closely tied to the Marcos regime, were uh, embedded in uh, various industries in the Philippines. And they essentially um, made themselves wealthy and made their patron, uh, President Marcos, wealthy uh, due to this uh, empowerment that they had uh, to control these particular industries in the Philippine economy. So um, here's a way to describe it. The Marcos style of management was like a wheel, a prominent Filipino businessman said. Marcos was the hub of the wheel. There were a lot of spokes leading to him, but the spokes didn't touch each other. Marcos always operated through cutouts. And uh, this is the way Richard Kessler of Carnegie Endowment for Peace uh, described it. Then he would take a percentage of things. What they did was give Marcos their cut. He hit everybody up for a percentage. And th that way they raised it uh, was uh, up to them. So this is uh, part of the model uh, of bad governance that was taking place during that time. And various parts of the economy, therefore, uh, were, were so badly governed because of this uh, linkage to uh, the Marcos regime. Uh, and uh, these particular cronies were basically given a lot of uh, economic power uh, to try and extract from these different uh, industries. So uh, here are some examples, well-known examples. Eduardo Coanco was known as the Coconut King. Florendo was uh, known as the Banana King. Dicini was known as the Tobacco King. Jose Campos was known as the Pharmaceutical King. And uh, Benedicto was known as the Sugar King. Uh, and of course, many of these uh, business leaders are still around today. Uh, and the challenge uh, eventually after the Marcos regime was uh, to what extent you can actually uh, extract some degree of uh, balance in the economy and perhaps some degree of accountability uh, without uh, further damaging the economy. We can talk a little bit about that later in, in the Q&A section, but suffice to say that um, I think uh, in general, um, we as a nation, we were unable to really push for a strong degree of accountability after the fall of the Marcos regime because many of the cronies basically uh, remained and were able to actually bounce back. Uh, so uh, one way to better understand um, the governance failure that took place then is by drawing on a concept uh, of corruption uh, which is uh, basically established by a good friend of mine, uh, Professor uh, Robert Klitgard of Harvard University. Now, Rob Klitgard uh, simplified the corruption formula into the following. Uh, es essentially, it, it, corruption is monopoly plus discretion minus accountability. Uh, and, and this is how he explained it. A monopoly of power, meaning you have a lot of power over the different economic sectors. Uh, and uh, this concentration of political power to that one family, the Marcos family, uh, was uh, basically setting itself up for uh, abuse. You then have a good deal of discretion on how that power is used. So there are no institutions guiding you on where and when and how uh, th that uh, political concentration of power can be, can be directed. And then you do not have strong accountability mechanisms uh, to tell you uh, what you're about to do is wrong, so you're not allowed to do that, meaning uh, there were uh, weak checks and balances during this period. So uh, if you uh, 
simplify it into this formula, monopoly plus discretion minus accountability, you have a very, very strong president who turned himself into a dictator uh, with a lot of discretion on how he can use his power and very few uh, institutions to tell him otherwise. And a very, very weak accountability in the lack of checks and balances in government. So Congress was weak then uh, and uh, basically pliant uh, and unable to push back against the president. So um, in the presence of this particular set of conditions triggered uh, the corruption that soon followed, which is really the set up for the case study that we wrote on the Bataan nuclear power plant. So it brings me to this uh, discussion of what are white elephants? Well, they are socially unprofitable investment projects that have turned into heavy burdens for business and or governments tasked with their maintenance. So this is the general description of what a white elephant is. In fact, the lore of white elephant is such that it's linked to this practice, this old uh, ancient practice in, uh, in Asia where um, a, a king was supposed to gift um, his, uh, um, uh, his subjects uh, an animal or an elephant. Uh, and uh, if the king did not really like the subject but still needed to gift that subject or, or give that subject something, uh, this king would give a white elephant and a white elephant would be an elephant that tends to be weak and not necessarily so productive so that it would become a burden to the subject that the king would give it to. So drawing on this lore, uh, it became quite common to describe uh, projects that have become a burden to countries as white elephants. Uh, so I'm just going to go through uh, the quick timeline of the Bataan nuclear power plant, uh, but because of the time constraints for my presentation, I will not go through all of the details, but I want to flag a few uh, details for you to consider. Um, and I do hope that you will uh, get to read the full case, which I shared with the organizers. First, uh, the PNPP was created as a, as a response to the 1973 oil crisis. So many countries were thinking of alternative uh, fuel sources in order to fuel their con continued industrialization. And the Philippines thought of nuclear power as uh, potentially that source of power. And uh, the BNPP was expected to boost the Philippines' electricity generation by 1,200 megawatts. Up to 60% of the entire BNPP cost was debt financed with the aid of the U.S. Export-Import Bank. So the Americans were actually selling us uh, nuclear power, uh, the, the plant that would generate nuclear power. And it financed, it helped us finance uh, the purchase, the acquisition of this nuclear power plant uh, through this uh, export-import bank. And uh, essentially, many countries have export-import banks to allow uh, buyers of their technology the means to finance the acquisition of that uh, said technology. Uh, in 1974, General Electric, which is a, a big company in the U.S., uh, entered negotiations with Napacor and offered to build two power plants for $700 million. But Westinghouse, which is another um, uh, American firm, won the contract with an offer of $500 million to build one plant. And this deal was facilitated by a person known as Herminio Dicini, a, a close uh, friend of Marcos, uh, who was allegedly promised $17 million in commission for facilitating the, the deal where uh, Westinghouse won the contract. Um, and who is Decini? Well, uh, Herminio Decini is married to Indai Esculin, Imelda, Imelda Marcus's first cousin. Uh, Decini started a small office, heard this in 1969, with a $3,500 bank loan. And a mere six years later, uh, Herminio Decini, uh, was seen heading 50 companies covering tobacco filters, cellophane, fabrics and yarn, nuclear power, real estate, airlines, computer services, and so on and so forth. So uh, this particular crony grew his business very, very aggressively in a very, very short period of time. And uh, I think it's well known that most of this growth uh, was due to political connections, not uh, necessarily to the competitiveness uh, of the company.
And the Sini's business empire had over $200 million in assets by 1978. And of course, $200 million in 1978 is, uh, is quite a big, a big amount, right? So um, what happens uh, to the BNPP, which uh, Herminio de Sini facilitated uh, uh, in order to be uh, procured by the Philippine government? Uh, in 1976, the contract is signed and the Philippine government is charged $750 million for a single reactor instead of the original two uh, reactors that uh, the Philippines was supposed to purchase and $250 million higher than the original amount. As, as you recall, um, the deal was for a one reactor worth $500 million. In fact, the, the Philippines ended up with uh, still a single reactor, but at $750 million, so $250 million more expensive. Uh, that's easily 50% um, uh, of the original amount, which is added to the debt uh, burden uh, that the country would now be facing. Uh, in March 1976, Westinghouse starts construction of the, on the site in Nap Napot Point, Morong Bataan. And in uh, 1978, construction is stalled because of concerns about the location. So suffice to say that during this entire process of setting up the plant, there were deep concerns about the location of the nuclear power plant. Uh, and therefore, uh, it was uh, generating a lot of um, uh, concerns. And uh, there, were, there was a lack of trust in the process by many citizens and civil society groups. Uh, because uh, they expected that this plant uh, may have been selected uh, not because of uh, scientific means and evidence-based means, but because of political connections. So this fed into the distrust uh, that is the background of that nuclear mm -hmm. power plant. So even if maybe nuclear power may be a good idea for the country, um, the distrust uh, that, that this particular project uh, began with is part of the weakness that it had to overcome uh, because essentially many, many Filipinos and many, many civil society groups um, distrust, distrusted um, or began to, to uh, distrust uh, this particular project and nuclear power altogether. So the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency uh, sent another group to study the safety of the, of the site in 1978. Um, and there were a number of uh, reviews of this site, uh, often finding uh, differently uh, after each other. And the plant is uh, later cleared again by government in, in that year. So I'm going to go through the rest of the details and uh, very, very quickly. So the, in came the EDSA revolution uh, and the Chernobyl uh, nuclear disaster that took place in Ukraine in April 1986. And there was an increased concern over nuclear power altogether, but particularly the governance uh, of the setup of the Bataan nuclear power plant. And by May 1986, the BNPP operating contract was suspended by the Aquino uh, administration. And uh, in 1986, uh, President Corey Aquino declared the Philippines would honor its debt incurred by the Marcos regime, which was a big decision then. Uh, and it actually generated um, differing views among the economic uh, leaders during this time. Uh, and Aquino uh, included an automatic appropriation for principal and interest payment of the external public debt, which became the big burden for our budget uh, for much of the two decades to follow. So um, in fact, the nuclear power plant was only fully paid around 2004, 2005, many, many uh, years uh, later. Uh, and uh, it uh, again suggests that a bad decision on an investment project that costs a lot of money and uh, implies a lot of debt can really uh, produce uh, a big, big uh, burden to society and to the economy uh, much, much later, uh, even after the, the regime has been uh, removed. So I'm going to go through this very quickly and just uh, mention here that Herminio Decini uh, was not really successfully convicted for uh, the corruption that took place uh, and was proven to take place uh, associated with that plant. And in 2001, Dicini actually returned to the Philippines. And in 2004, the Ombudsman filed two cases in Sandigan Bayan charging Dicini with corruption of public officials and with the violation of uh, our corruption laws. 
Uh, but by 2012, Sandigan Bayan ordered Vicini to return more than $50 million of commission from the BNPP deal. Um, the Sandigan Bayan, however, dismissed the case against Marcos, stating that while the close relationship between Marcos and Vicini was established, there is insufficient evidence to prove that the former actually obtained any part of the commission. So Marcos got away scot-free, but Vicini, uh, the good friend of Marcos, was actually asked to return uh, the money that was supposed to have been stolen. And the su Supreme Court affirmed the 2012 Sandigan Bayan decision in 2013, but uh, in 2014, Arminio Vicini passed away due to organ failure and no money uh, was returned to the Philippine government and the Filipino people. So I, I will end uh, the presentation, which is a fairly abbreviated one, I hope uh, you're able to follow, again with the, with the story of uh, Robert Plateguard's formula of corruption, uh, which will hopefully give us a sense of um, developing ways to fix our systems, fix our institutions, so that a big mistake like the Bataan nuclear power plant uh, doesn't happen ever again. And again, you go to the formula, monopoly of power, plus discretion on how that power is used, minus accountability uh, results in a high a probability of corruption. And uh, I believe, along with many economists, that uh, even as we face corruption challenges still in our government today, uh, that our institutions are generally um, able to recover during the period that followed the fall of the dictator. And one hopes that these institutions are enough to try and prevent another big white elephant project from taking place. What are those institutional reforms? Well, uh, the procurement law, for instance, which uh, limits uh, some of the discretion on how uh, some of these uh, resources can be spent. Um, the return, hopefully, of a strong uh, legislature and certainly a more independent Senate that allows you to fiscalize and uh, hold accountable um, the budgets uh, sent there by the executive uh, so that you have groups that can now look at um, these particular projects and uh, basically argue uh, either for them or against them uh, on the merits of these projects. And then you have um, hopefully stronger accountability uh, institutions. And uh, unfortunately, there have been signals of weakness in some of these accountability institutions recently, such as um, the recent de decision of uh, our ombudsman uh, to try and limit access to sal ends the statement of assets and liabilities and net worth uh, which we hope uh, will be quickly reversed because the transparency and access to the sal end is actually one of the important accountability mechanisms that we have set up uh, since the fall of the dictator that allows citizens and civil society groups to hold their government uh, much more strongly accountable. So taken together, uh, these are the types of reforms uh, that we have put in place to try and prevent another uh, white elephant project like the Bataan nuclear power plant. But make no mistake that the reform uh, agenda is not yet fully complete and we still need to continue to strengthen institutions so that um, the likelihood of better projects will improve and the likelihood of bad projects, uh, white elephant projects like BNPP, will finally be uh, limited uh, even more. Thank you for the chance to give you this very, very uh, abbreviated presentation, which I'm happy to talk about some of the details uh, in the question and answer portion.